Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Barlight TV. Last week you had the opportunity of seeing uh, Phil Galahad starting cracking Speedball 2 on the Amiga. So learning how to crack on the Amiga. And that one ended in a cliffhanger. He actually had a version that was supposed to work but didn't. It epically failed in the very, very last um, instance of that uh, episode. This is episode two where we will continue where we left off. There will be uh, a section cut out, which is sort of the error searching. That will be uh, presented as a bonus feature. So if you're really interested in, in um, when Phil is doing sort of the, the fault finding of his uh, little issue, then do also watch that one. But uh, we will spare you that one if you're sort of only interested in what actually progresses further. So over to Cracking on the Amiga, the concluding part. Now that we've um, copied the disk and we've shown that it doesn't work, we now need to um, patch the routines to make sure that we know that it, uh, we've done it. So knock out the extra memory routine, speed up the loading, because he's got time to wait. And I'm breaking. Right, so 836A. Eh? Making sure we don't overextend on the removal of this particular instruction. Yeah. And using one now of. <laughs> just one, and we're good. Just the, just the one. Just the one. And then we need to knock out this routine. And this routine, as we recall, modifies that call to the copy lock. Well, what we do, what don't want to, to happen is leave that in there, and it corrupts that no op. Yeah. Um, which obviously no operation, which means it just carries on to the next instruction, um, unscrews it up and interprets it as something else and crashes the Amiga anyway. So yep. 4B0 branch to 84C4, which means all the stuff here is missed so that this routine here doesn't get modified. Yes. Yes, that would that. So that is the uh, the routine that eventually gets the line F there. Yeah. So eventually, that was the one that gets a three six a. That would the a three six a gets changed to a line F. Yeah. Which then triggers the call to the copy lock yeah. through the exception table there at two C. Yeah. Um. So now the copy lock can't be called and isn't being called. So now just for this. Just to test to make sure that this works, we're now going to manually poke in the values that the copy lock modifies. 03, 03, That was... Half time. It's the half time. MDCC8. This puts... the RTS and another piece of code in. Yeah. Not, a, an R, not an RTS. I have no idea what this one does, but it modifies it, so we're changing it. We've got no breakpoints active. We've done that one, so that can't be modified. We've done that one. All the copy locks just been done. The copy locks there, but will never be called. So you can be validated and and check and some. So then what uh, we'll do is we'll now try and load the game and there should be it should be fairly noticeable that the copy is now gone Gone. 
Uh, with the copy lock noise gone, it means it's faster to load. Yeah. Um, and it means it's not searching additional drives for a copy lock it can't find. Yeah. So let's let's do a knockout game. Because we're not using extra memory at the moment, although there's no reason why we will stop this from working in for the game upon a release. Oh, Get ready. look what didn't happen before. And obviously you are now about to witness some stellar people to go. Which thing, uh, it wasn't me at the joint park, right, Nick? Because I... Oh, my good God. I'm rubbish at this game. I love this game, but I'm rubbish at it. But my only excuse is I'm using a cheap Amazon joypad, and for years I've played this game on a joystick. The only thing I didn't like about this game was your thumb felt like it had been ruined after you played it. It just felt destroyed. I used to play this a lot with my brother-in-law. I've successfully touched the ball at the wrong end of the... After that. So, and, and uh, since we're not uh, in the habit of playing games and, and uh, showing it to people, the, the reason why we're watching this is that we will let the ga game run into halftime. Because if halftime message is shown properly, that means that the patch is fully working. Get in! I'm not completely useless! <laughs> oh no! I'm winning just nothing still! 10 seconds to go. And what we're looking for in the top left hand corner is the half line. Because one of the things the copy lock does is fixes that text. Obviously, so. Really? There we go. Half and time. that works. Yes! Obviously, we can't, um, you can't release a game like this where you give instructions, um, with action replay on how to, um, you know, play this, um, this game. Yeah. Uh, so, crap this game, sorry. Mm. Right, so let me just... I just need to check one piece of code very quickly, which I forgot to write down. I didn't actually write it down. Perhaps you can edit this bit out. So I don't look like a chump. <laughs> I mean, there there is a value in showing that we are all humans and... Uh... No. Not everything is done in two seconds. No, 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 no. We're meant to look like gods, remember? Oh. You've <laughs> forgotten, forgotten the golden rule. We are not fallible. We are. We never make mistakes, and we're like, we're like Batman. We always get it right. Well, I, I have the habit. When my kids say, oh, God, I just arrive and say, you called me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my missus, when I say stuff, I just looks at me as if I'm beneath her. Frankly, uh. right. So, going to reset the Amiga. Obviously, the disc needs to be have all the cracked stuff in it. It it can't be that the the person who's um, playing the game needs instructions on how to load stuff in an action replay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to reboot into memory. There's a boot block. Mm. Uh, we've got all this room where it says speedball and copyright and all that nonsense. You don't need all that stuff. They're not checking for that. It's mm. um, it's just self-indulgence on the Bitmap Brothers, basically. Yep. Uh, but if we need room, we've got the room. So it's not a problem. But we need to find out where the end of the text is so we can get rid of it and we know where we can fit our code. So there's near the end. Speedball. So if I just do... 8514287D4. The code's not going to be anywhere near as big as that. But now we see we've got rid of 
all that text is out of the bloody way. So now that we know that, we can now build our crack routine. We can do it in memory. Um, and we just need to look at the boot block to see exactly how it is that we are going to do this. 84. Right, so looking at the boot block there, what it's telling me is it's going to load It's going to basically, it's going to put an address in a 80, it's, it's moved something into 84. What has it put into 84? It's put something into 84. Ah, it's moving D0 into 84. All right, I see. It's going to be allocating some memory, and this is where it's going to be loading the boot block into memory. So we're, we're not going to fart around with this. We're going to we're going to see exactly what we're dealing with here. Well, I happen to know that on a five hundred twelve k slow mem system uh, and a 512k chip 512k slow mem system i happen to know where the boot block's going to be loaded up by that's just through experience um that's where it'll load it it'll go to 1558 i haven't gone there randomly i just happen to know that's where it's going to load it up so mm -hmm. so i haven't loaded up to that the system has loaded has read the first track it's read the boot block it's now executing the code in the boot block and I need to know where it's going to go. So I'm going to stick a breakpoint at that jump, which is the final part of the boot block. And it's moved 8.4, so it's 5.9 E8. So this is the loader that it loads off the disk to actually load the intro. So let's go to 5.9 E8. Right, and then that's a small transfer routine between 59E8 and 5A06. What it's going to do is it's going to transfer the intro loader code down to address 84, which is like in the trap address area. Basically, it's the Bitmap Brothers giving uh, a would-be cracker as little room as possible to put a crack routine down in the bottom of memory, mm. and also so they can use as much memory as possible. Mm. Um, both of those can be true. Right, so what we're going to do, so we know where it's going, it's going to 59E8. So let's break point. Ah, right. It's crashed. Has it crashed? Yeah, it's crashed. Uh, sometimes the action replay doesn't like doing break points on stuff going into low memory. So let's try that again. Which is fine. Right, so we're back at that memory tune again. So instead of putting a breakpoint in it, we just assemble the uh, jump to 84 to itself. So it's an infinite branch. Go. It will have transferred. So now it's copied down to low memory, but yeah, you you are telling memory. it that you couldn't call it. You were yeah, trapping so that it's... call. Sometimes action replay doesn't like it when stuff's really low in memory, and yeah. certain conditions are met to do with interrupts and all that kind of stuff. And we can see what that's going to do. That is going to load the code up at thirty-two thousand. If you look at this routine here. At address 90, 32,000 is where it's going to be loading code. At address 98, it's giving it sec to 16 to start. And at 9C, it's saying load 258 in hex sectors. Because this here is a standard Rob Northern loader. Mm. So 
It's brilliant for doing RAM load stuff. Right, because we don't want the damn thing crashing again, assemble C4 as C4, and then go 84. There we go, it's stopped. Assemble C4 as jump A0. It's put 32,000 in A0. And there's some code there. I wonder if uh, it's all unpacked. Let's have a look. No, it might be packed with something. Okay, because you would find the uh, copy lock routine if yeah, if, 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 if it, it was, was unpacked, we would we would we would find um, we'd find the copy lock, and then we'd know that all the. So I'm guessing there must be some sort of packer in there. Yeah, you can see here. This looks like a basic packing routine. So what it does is it loads the the intro packed intro code to thirty two thousand. And then it jumps up to the top of memory. Basically, it jumps to the end of the, the, the data it's just loaded. And then what it's going to do is, if you look at the bottom there, it's got a jump to 84. It is now going to depack that data it's loaded over address 84. And because this is higher, it can then jump to afterwards. So we can prove that if we do... 797E, branch that to itself, let it run. Probably finished about now. It has. Mm. If we look at 84, well, that's totally different. Mm. I know that the copy lock is at 1506C. No, so has it got more unpacking to do? Or has it encrypted it? It looks like it's encrypted it. Yeah, it looks like there's some sort of encryption to hide the fact that the copy lock's there. But is, but the rest of the code, the important stuff that we actually need to modify, isn't encrypted at all. So the fact that the copy lock's encrypted is it completely irrelevant. Four B zero, we can modify that. Two five D six, the half time, the text is all there. So we know that once it gets to this place in memory, everything's unpacked and it can um, we can then patch the code. So we now need to find a, a free area of memory that we can jump to. What's the stack space? 7C, 7F. So I'm going to do this again, and the reason why will be uh, will remain obvious. So if I do this, whoops. Fair, obviously. I've just filled up a, a memory space oh. with LT, and the reason why you've done that should be obvious. You want, on... you want to see if it's getting clearer by the program. Gets clear. I can break in because I know it's going there. Was it already there? I can't remember. That's right, it's already there. So assemble C4 again as C4. Let's speed the loading up because we don't need to wait. So that's going to go to 32,000. And then 7C92A. The assemble 7C97E. Branch 7C97E. It should be at our branch now. 
just before it jumps into the intro, it is. Now let's go look at this bit of memory. Oh, wrong one. Still there. It's still there, which means that we can put our crack routine up at this memory address, knowing that in the boot process and the loading process, none of this gets corrupted. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So, whoops, give it the correct information would be used. Right, so we're going for the boot block. We're going for the end of the boot block there, 8514. Right, so that jump there, 8512, that is the final jump um, from the boot block to the, the, the booter code, yep. loader code. So what we need to do is we need to create our correct routine and then create a small routine that copies it into the destination that we want to put it into. So what we do is this. So we need to assemble in memory that's away from the boot block. That's nowhere near the boot block. Right, so the first three lines is to do with the stuff that the copy lock does. Mm -hmm. And the fourth line, the, the 4E71 into 83D6, that's to knock out the line F that calls the copy lock. Yep. And then uh, 1024, the 6016 into 84BO is to put a branch in that routine that modifies 83D6 to turn it into a line F in the first place. And then at the end, obviously, we've got the jump into the intro once it's depacked. Mm -hmm. We don't need to figure out how long it is because I've done it at such a sensible address. It tells me that it's 30 bytes long. So that's fantastic news. So. Idiot. Hey, okay. 4-2-0 on the PC. Into a one and a seven f forty three into a two move quick thirty minus one d zero move dot b a one plus into a two plus d bra d zero with four a c jump zero for the four. Trans one three one oh three oh four four. Right, so there's our very simple routine there at four hundred. It's locating the start of the crack routine into A1. It's locating the destination routine into A2 where we want the crack routine to go. Because we're going to be using a DBRA instruction um we need to do it as minus one because it doesn't go to zero, it goes to minus one. So we're moving 30 bytes, so it's 30 minus one into D zero. And then obviously this is the move byte routine that moves um, the crack routine from where it is to where it wants to go. And then that's the decrement counter there, the D bra, which does it until it gets to minus one. And then previously set up in the boot block was the piece of code that jumps to A zero um from the 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 from a routine set up in the boot block mm. so let's go one five what was it eight four zero zero i think it was eight five one two yeah so if we trans 400 to 444 to eight five one two because of new pc relative code if you notice there that that address there has changed correctly to that one 
that one there is an absolute address because we don't want that to relocate. We want to, we know that area of memory is free and we don't want to piss around. Um, now we need to do a boot block check. So, so it's, it's setting the new checksum for the new content. So obviously, when the, when the Amiga loads up the, the disk, is it, it reads in the boot block, yeah. it checks the first long word to see whether or not it's a kickstart disk or it's a DOS disk or what type of DOS disk it is. Um, and then after that comes the checks, and then it compares to make sure the calculation is correct. If it's mm -hmm. correct, it will allow the, the disk to boot. Right now, what we need to do is we need to adjust that jump, the final jump. So, what I'm doing here is I know that that intro code's on the first part of the disk up to track 28. So, I'm reading the first half of the disk into memory. And I'm checking. I'm going through that um, that red in disk image to find the final jump to 84, because obviously we don't want it to go to 84 anymore. I mean, I could do this by patching um, on the fly memory addresses and what have you. Mm. Um, but it's speed. And there it is there. I'm going to slow that down there. So if we go 55960, that was the code there. Because mm. there was the funky DPAC routine afterwards. And because they've been so accommodating, it's not a short address. If you see there, the address at 84 has now been changed to where our crack routine is going to be located. Mm. Right track 0, 80. Tell it where the start of the data is. And we can do it faster than that. Do -do -do. Right, if we got this right, we should now have... It should be working now. Intro depacking. Intro running. It's yes. working because otherwise it's randomly gone out the end of memory and it's managed to magically work. So if we now check our memory addresses, 836A, what? Whoa, what's going on? Our routine is there at least. <laughs> Have I done the wrong one? Did I not write right enough data down? Fuck's sake, what's going on? Your editor's going to be busy. <laughs> See what I've done here. Wish I'd done it a long winded way now. Oh, you had a a jump that you saved, or no? Yeah, I saved. Yeah, it's there. Why has that not worked? It crashed. It bloody ass as well. Bear with me.
So the loaded stuff is there and the call to uh, 7F1000 yeah. is there and the routine on 7F1000 is there and... Uh... Yup. Nice, that's definitely working. Oh, you dick. What a knobhead. <laughs> what was it? The specific address that I checked. I'm like, oh my God, it has some bloody work. How is that possible? How is the Amiga not crashed? I got the memory address wrong. I've put 83D6 and it's not, it's 836A. What? I got a memory address wrong. <laughs> How the hell did I manage that? Eight three six A. Oh, the, okay, yeah. What a twat. <laughs> and now you wrote it back again, so Yeah, yeah, when we not in the room now, we're professionals. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's the... where it's supposed to be. Yeah, not not way down here. Ah. Eight four B A. No, it's not. It's eight four B zero, isn't it? There we go. There's the branch that branches round. And then if we look at the half time, half time text is written in there. And then so when we do this. Obviously, we'll have to run through this again so that the editor's got a question and they can't be spilled. There's going to be lots of jerky with puzzle blocks and... Oh, no, it works. It must be magic. It will work now. I promise you. Yeah, fingers crossed. No, no, no thing is needed. Get ready. And just let it run forward now, so we will see it. <laughs> oh, dear. Must be something wrong, I'm scoring. So in 25 seconds, the truth will be revealed. Good word.
Oh, actually. I can't believe that schoolboy error, that getting the memory drifts wrong, isn't it? Oh. Great, should we pause the game and uh get ready? I guess wrap up because uh now we've seen all the parts. Yes. Um and and I guess we need to have sort of we need to lose the sound of the game because it's uh the, the flushing in the background. Great. Thanks. Okay, so I think I followed actually most of it, but uh, and and this is very different from the way I I do things on the C64, where I extract everything and and I package it up and add a crack throw and then crunch it and then put it back using normal file system. This is more working, assuming that the uh, you you're touching very little of the uh, stuff that sits on the disk uh, basically as little as possible you're just sneaking in the small changes you need to have there to make the the version work properly yeah i mean on the amiga i think i think that the, the big change for the amiga is there used to be a massive um single filing compact scene on the amiga yeah uh, but the problem is, lots of the early Amiga games were just basically conversions of the ST stuff, mm -hmm. even to the point where, obviously, Sound Tracker wasn't really wasn't adopted by anyone. Some people were using samples and that, but quite a lot of it was chip type music. And of course, when you're using sixteen color graphics and chip type music, it all compresses down incredibly well. And then, of course, on the Amiga, Pro Tracker, Sound Tracker, Noise Tracker basically module format with heavy on samples and that, mm. because obviously the Amiga was so good at playing it, mm. became the norm. Mm. Um, it started to get to the stage where people rip in games to files solely so they could go onto compacts. Uh, it ceased to be a thing, because mm. very quickly, packers started being used, samples were being used, and before you knew it, a disc was completely full i mean you could rip it to files if you wanted to but you might only have maybe 100k free on the disc oh. let us face it even in the early days of the amiga i don't think there was many games that were 100k mm -hmm. um that you could have fitted as a compilation so i mean yeah i mean it's easy to especially when um developers use rob northern sector loader it's so easy to to turn like Speedball 2 into a filed version. Um, but you've got to consider, excuse me, you've got to consider how much room it's going to take on the disc mm. and whether or not you can fit something else on there with it. Oh. Um, and it, it just, it just basically, the scene decided that um, compilations were nice and all that, but getting the releases out first and 100% was, was the, was the, was the end goal. And, Obviously, because the Amiga got so popular and got so big, you know, a, a cracker really wouldn't have time for all mm. that. They would release a, a, a version, and they perhaps want to make sure that everything was in there. They didn't want to sacrifice title screens, which, you know, really don't add anything, but you could take them out so you could single file the game. But, they, you know, the, the major crackers started getting so busy, they just didn't have time for that. They had time to crack a release get it out as fast as possible and think, well, we'll leave that for for somebody else if that's what they want to do. But, you know, as time got on, the games got bigger and bigger, you know, regularly on two discs. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the scene in comparison, I, I'd say the Atari ST scene was, was very much like the Commodore 64 scene in a way, mm -hmm. in that because they had the chip type music, um, and it was 16 color graphics that they could get the games to compress down very well. Mm. And, and right up to the end, they were still releasing compilation discs with like three or four games on there, um, mm. which you just couldn't do on the Amiga because they were doing, you know, the originals were using large capacity discs and they'd need an extra disc as it was. Um, 
And so, there is there is no point in in having the disc eighty percent full uh, rather than one hundred percent full because that extra twenty percent wouldn't gain you anything. It's it's no. not used for anything else. So you might as well use all of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, if you've got one game that's worth keeping, that other game, which is like maybe like a hundred k, it's going to have to be some kind of exceptional game for you to mm. want to bother playing it anyway. So why go to the effort? Yeah. So if you would squeeze in a cracker, a crack, crack throw here in the process, would you just store it to the disc and have the boot block kick it, kickstart it, and then play it, and then return, and then continue the process? Or how would that yeah, be? Yes. All, all you would do is you would just find somewhere in the boot, boot block, usually before it starts doing its stuff for Speedball 2, you would just put a BSR in there, to obviously you could see that there's now plenty of room, room in a boot block oh. um, and you would just load use track disc the same way that the that bitmap brothers are loading their loader off the oh. disc to load off your crack tray you'd find a free area on the disc um and you just write it to there and then you would call it and then left mouse button usually to exit out of it it would return mm. to the boot block and then carry on the loading process as long as your code's clean and restores everything back as it's supposed to if you've s some games and that were quite finicky um about how they set things up so sometimes what you would do is you'd load your cracker into memory you would then load their code into memory jump to your crack row and then jump back to the code that had been loaded already mm -hmm. so you didn't have to worry too much about the environment you left it because that developer's code was going to take over the system anyway it all depends on the game some games were very fussy other games were were quite happy but obviously as experience with amiga grew better and better um coders of crackro started getting better and there was less compatibility problems mm. there was less issues with going back to the boot block and carrying on the DOS process to load something else in the boot block. Um, I know in the early days it was it was a bit hit and miss because obviously they weren't quite sure what the safe memory areas were. Yeah. They, uh, and then sometimes they'd screw up by not setting their crack tray to only load into chip RAM. They would just find fast memory and try and run from there, and it couldn't. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would say that... Um, from like 89 onward, most of the problems that crackers and crack tray makers had with the Amiga, they'd long since solved, um, and it, it wasn't an issue anymore. So, mm. so yeah, putting a crack tray on Speedball 2 would have been easy. Be, and, and you can tell that, really, because the obviously something like that, you could have used DMS, Disk Smasher System, which basically reads the disk in a, a track at a time, compresses each track, and saves it out to a file. Well, the size of that file would kind of let you know that there'll be room on the disk. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a, a, an Amiga um, disk playing disk image is 901K. Well, if after Disk Mash has been through it, and they're sending you a file at, like, 500K, then either nothing's packed on that disk, or there's plenty of free room. Mm. But but that's also why text typer intros on the Amiga were very popular because the copy lock track takes up room. Well, obviously, now you're doing away with the copy lock track. You don't need it anymore. A small text typer intro will fit in the space left by the copy lock. Mm. Um, and you knew that you weren't going to be clashing with anything else. Mm. So... Um, yeah, it's um, it all, sometimes it depends how the game's cracked. I mean, you find um, some groups loved, like Crystal, during their height. It's it's all they ever used for about a year um, was a text. It was so boring to look at, but literally every other release was by Crystal at that point. And it's obvious the cracker just didn't have time to put anything else flashy oh. on there because... It, the second he'd finished that one, I'm guessing it must have been IBM back then, he had another crack to do and another crack to do. So mm. you you kind of you kind of do whatever the situation dictates. 
Well, and, and you also know that uh, if you remove the copy lock, uh, and you do know that that space is taken by that, uh, if you store something else on some other place of the disk, there might be a slim chance that that is used for something else, and then you run into problems. So you're actually introducing potential problems by, by placing stuff on some other plot or part of the disk. I mean, yeah, I mean, what most people did is they would stick it, they stick their Cratcho right on the very end of the disc, like track yeah. 79. Um, and usually you could tell whether or not you were okay, because if they'd formatted the disc properly beforehand, and you still had all the, the, the format strings on the track data because it hadn't been overwritten since it had been mastered, yeah. then you knew that you could write there and there'd be no problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, but for sure, writing in the copy lock space, and, and also the copy lock itself a, a lot of the ways that people introduce the copy lock in their uh in their code is they'd have their main code that would stay memory resident from the second it booted up with the copy lock in it and the copy lock was great because you knew that copy lock code took up x amount of space mm. which you could get rid of and if you wanted to put a loader anywhere you could put it where the copy lock was mm. thank you very mm. much rob northern yeah yeah makes total sense I'm quite aware that a number of the things might have gone a bit too fast and, and a few things were possibly um, took possibly a bit too long. So you dozed off and didn't catch what was actually said and uh, what was relevant or not. So this would be my attempt to summarize the process we have seen. So the first step was uh, running uh, uh, Phil's own tool for detecting copy lock. And here copy lock is one of the available um, copy protection mechanisms that were predominant on the, on the platform. So, I mean, it's not the only one, it's just one of those who were, uh, which you could find on original games. So Phil detects that and, and tells if it has copy lock on it or not. So the next thing uh, he needs to do is find the actual copy lock routine in memory. He does that by, by searching for the string ONZ or ONC, depending on where you live in the world. Um, we don't need to understand what that is or, or why it's there. It's just that it's one of those searchable strings that appear in the actual copy lock routine, uh, seemingly in all variants of it. It's not the start. So when you find it, you need to kind of traverse back to find the actual start of it. But, uh, but that is one way to actually find where it is in memory. The, the next thing we need to uh, know and make a note of, if we don't remember it, is where the call to the copy lock is found. In this case, it's not a jump to subroutine or, or any sort of call like that. It is triggering an exception. So there is sort of a 68,000 instruction for triggering that exception. And then the machine jumps to copy lock via the exception vector, which is set to point to the uh, copy lock routine. So again, there is no direct jump. It is an exception via the vector that calls the routine. Uh, and, then, and then running the game, uh, that triggering, the, the instruction that does the triggering, that, was, that one is not there originally. So when you load the game, everything looks like it's there, but, but that one isn't there because there is another routine that is ex executed prior to this which is sort of changing the cop the content of the code. So it's sort of self-modifying code. And the result of that sort of modifier routine is that the triggering of the exception, that instruction is sort of there in the memory once that uh, modifying routine is run. So that is that. And then, then we have sort of, we know how to, call copy lock and we know how it's it's sort of triggered what we now need to do is to uh, validate the changes that copy lock does in memory uh, so you set a freeze point to the instruction just before the copy lock routine is called 
and when that triggers you are copying the content of the entire memory the 512k up into um, some sort of, of spare memory that you have and and phil here uses a trick to make the computer not detect his high memory uh, so that one is free so it's not used by the game so he could eventually copy the entire thing to there and then put a new freeze point to after copy lock has been executed so trigger a breakpoint just before copy the entire th uh, memory content to uh, another bank set a new freeze point to after copy lock has been executed and then compare the two and every byte that is a difference here between the uh, the copied uh, area and what is in memory now is a potential thing that copy lock has changed as so so making modifications to the game um, so that it would crash or behave erroneously if the copy lock isn't there properly and make all of the notes and um, and some of the changes are not relevant i mean you would see changes from calling to uh, to subroutines inside the copy lock so that would be uh, pushed to stack and and what have you not so not all changes are relevant and not all of them are deliberate uh, from the copy lock but a number of them will be uh, so all the changes you find make notes of them and ensure that you then look at what seems like something that copy lock could have been deliberately changing and it's not being like a side effect of, of just executing code uh, yes 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 um, I'm just comparing my notes here um, so and the last thing which is also sort of the preparatory work here is to find a place where you can install a little patch routine so you need to find a place in memory which is not um, overwritten or or changed by the game itself until it has run it's fine if it's trashed afterwards uh, it's just one of those things that needs to be implemented run once and then could be for forgotten about uh, so so what phil did was changing or filling an area of the memory with flt exclamation mark i think it was uh, and then running the game and setting a freeze point just to before the game starts. And if nothing was sort of changed to that area, then that was a safe one to use for his little patchy things. Okay, so these are all the data you need to have before uh, started actually to implement the crack. So that, that is collecting all the data we needed for implementing the crack or prior to implementing the crack. Now we're looking at implementing it. So we need to loop into a place uh, in the actual normal execution uh, and then call our little patch routine uh, and then just jump back to the normal execution. Um, having sort of mimicked the uh, the changes that copylock is doing uh, and ensuring that we also patch out anything that could potentially break um, so the call to the copylock should of course be uh, eliminated and, and if there is something that is changing the call to the copylock then that also needs to be sort of patched out so these are the things we should do now and uh, so the, the first thing that uh, that Phil did was he made a copy of the original. So just use any normal kind of DOS copier. Uh, I think the burst nibbler thing he used is something that is built into the action replay. I'm not really sure, but uh, suddenly a burst nibbler appeared out of, out of nowhere. And, and I guess that was built into the action replay. Phil reads half the disk into memory um, and again via some magic uh, ma uh, action replay command and then search inside this chunk of data that he read from the disk uh, and he finds a suitable place to um, 
well to kind of hook into the process that is the place where the game calls uh, or basically the load process is completed and is calling the uh, the actual game and so knowing where that is so recording the address it's calling for starting the game uh, jot that down on a piece of paper and then changed that to calling his routine and the routine is not no longer or not yet there but it is basically writing down a jump to that um, the identified area of memory where he wants to put his little routine it's not there yet but he ensures that uh, the game calls that place and by changing the, co the 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 jump address inside the game and then he writes back that half disk again so now we have uh, a disk that is copyable via normal dos copy and there is something that diverts the uh, normal execution of the, the game by calling this area uh, which is identified as available uh, and that's what it's doing now so if we're running it in that state it will call that area and it will crash because there is nothing in that area so the next part would be write the small routines that execute the patches and ends by calling the start address we recorded previously um, it was that address that was jumped to the start of the game so we, we recorded that and that is now in that little patch routine. So, and that patch routine should patch out the, or patch in the values that CopyLock intentionally changed inside the game. And it should knock out the actual call to the CopyLock routine. And it should also knock out the routine that's sort of made changes to that routine or or that instruction that eventually called the copy log so these are sort of the three categories of changes and then read in the boot block uh, write a little routine that copies an area of the boot block into that magic area found that is called that we already implemented and then have the boot block call that little copy routine as well and then do a, a recalculation of the boot block checksum and then write back the boot block. And hey presto, we now have a working crack. The boot block is read in. It is copying that little routine to the uh, area of memory that was found to be available. The game is, is starting to load and then at some point it calls that little routine of ours. That routine patches away the copyloc call and the, um, yeah, the triggering of the copyloc call. It's mimicking all the stuff that copyloc changed that it needs to change. And then the rest of the process is as normal. The rest of the game works as normal. It's just that copyloc is no longer there. This method is quite robust, I would say, without having cracked anything on the MIGA. The, I mean, the logic is absolutely flawless and it should be able to kind of find everything and anything. So it should be a solid crack after this. If you would like to add a crack throw, you could on the boot block uh, read in a number of sectors that were found to be available and then show that, call that, and then return to the boot block logic and then continue loading the game from wherever it was. But that is sort of how Phil suggests that you should attack games like this. So, <laughs> so Phil, uh, in the very beginning here, you said that uh, most of the time you didn't have access to the real original. And of course, the real original, only the real original will actually go through and pass the, uh, the actual protection checks here. And the process that we just went through was actually sort of using an original. Even if it was uh, using an emulator, it was an image with all the protections still intact on it. So. How would you have done it if you didn't have access to the real original? You had a copy and then you had some remote guy sitting with the actual original for you. 
What do you do? The process wouldn't have been massively different. Um, the great thing about when the likes of the Bitmap Brothers use um, uh, Rob Northern's um, disc routines is his loader, his scepter loader's also got built-in functions to save as well. Mm. So, obviously, I, can, I still have the data that the original supplier has sent me, and I can still know when the copy lock's about to come in. I know the code that's going to activate it. It's quite easy for me to modify that version where just before the copy lock is about to fire off, mm. I can paint the screen green. Um, and then this signifies to the original supplier that he needs to put the original disc in his drive. Mm. And then he would press the left mouse button. The copy lock would do its check, would modify all the memory addresses it's going to modify. Um, and then I'd have a routine there to paint the screen red. And then he would take the original out of the drive, and then he would put back in the drive the um, the modified copy that I've sent him mm. um, over the modem, um, and he'd put that disk in the drive. And then what I would do is I would just be um, a parasite and just use Rob Morgan's save routines to now save out that 512k of chip RAM that we know has now been modified by the copy lock oh. out onto that disk. And then once the pro that process is finished, paint the screen yellow so that the original supplier knows it's finished. Mm. And then he would then DMS me the disk, which is just basically a, a, an archiver. It reads a disk and it compresses the tracks. He would send that to me. And hey, presto, I've now got the modified data from the copy lock mm. i don't have to guess what memory routines pardon me because the original supplier has done it all on his machine it's passed the copy lock check mm. he sent it back to me i will then extract that data off the disk i will then do a compare with um i can just reload the disk again and do a compare of the data before the copy lock fires off and I will then find all the addresses that need to be modified. Um, so I haven't had to decrypt the copy lock. Um, I've made no assumptions about the copy lock other than knowing it's going to modify memory addresses and fix things in the program to make sure that it works. And I've now 100% got that data. Yep. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, obviously, having the original disk is a lot easier because you don't have to go through that extra step with the original supplier. Mm. But the original supplier is adept enough to follow coloured prompts. Yeah. And he images the disk back to me, and I've got all the data I need. Um, right. So, yeah, so from that perspective, it's um, it's um, it adds one extra step, but as you can see, it's not particularly complicated. So in the um, in the in the previous process that we went through, you were comparing stuff you sent to the to fast memory, and then you compared it to what was in memory. That was before and after. That that's where you had the before and after. So now you would have your before and after, where one of the images would be somewhere in fast memory, and the other one would be what you load, uh, which your your supplier was providing you because he was generating that for you. So yeah, I mean, obviously, if I want the untouched, the untouched copy lot memory, oh. I just load up a copied version of the original disk oh. before the copy lot fires off. And so you, you have your capture. Uh, you, I mean, you you change colors before copy lock, so he knows he should insert from a version that you did, and yeah, then so I, then I, he I, needs I, to to use copy lock the original disk to read the actual copy lock from that one and then when that one is done getting back to your stuff and then save out uh, the um, yeah what yeah, was in memory then basically the original supplier doesn't have to do anything other than follow the colored prompts that yeah. the, the, the the ability to patch rob northern's loader to save yeah. the memory onto disk but the original supplier doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't need to know any code whatsoever. Mm. And he can just save the data out on the disk. 
I mean, obviously, once he sends me that disk, the data that has been saved onto disks, that is the bit that goes into that goes into fast memory. That's the modified copy. Yeah. And then I just reload the copy again, yeah. but stop it before the copy lock, and then I'll find all the changes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it would have been possible to even do this all from the original supplier's end, oh. where as I could have copied um, the untouched memory to fast RAM, allowed it to do the copy lock check, mm. have a routine in there that would then find all the modifications, yeah. and then save the modifications out on the disk, say, this memory address is this value, this memory address is this value, but obviously you're going to get you're going to get a lot of false positives because you're mm. going to get stack space. You're going to get, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, what, what, what do I need to use here? Do I need this? Do I need that? Whereas if you've got it in memory and you can directly compare the two, you can see where the stack space is because you can interrogate the registers and you're like, mm. well, I can clear that mm. bit of memory. I don't need to worry about what's in there because that stack space and that's always going to be changing. Um, so, yeah, it's not complicated. So I know a lot of the a lot of the crackers um, back then were start. They they'd already figured out how to decode the copy lock, um, and they were able to. They'd have generic tools where they could extract the key from the disk, and then they would then hardwire the key into the copy lock. Oh. But it just so happens that there's something wrong with the Speedball 2 copy lock um, <laughs> where it actually doesn't decode properly on an A1200, for instance. So that method of cracking the copy lock um, retains the copy lock and means that it fails um, and doesn't work on faster processors, whereas the version I did which emulates what the copy lock does without letting the copy lock run, does. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some crackers that would think doing cracking speed or two that way is lame, but I'm I'm I like to be I like to be thorough. Mm. I've got all the data I could possibly need mm. at the right instance. Um, and I don't have to rely on an original supplier misinterpreting something. Mm. It's all on me. Mm. So if if I miss anything out, it's on me. I'm the one that's missed it. Mm. Uh, nobody else. Um, so and I don't care because whatever it takes to get the game cracked hundred percent is yeah. is the goal. So I I absolutely agree. I mean. <laughs> And, and I still think it's kind of cute that you you basically take the game and you do a bit of a modification and it gives you a memory dump. So you 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 re basically use the game to re to you you adjust it to into being a memory dumper for you, so that the uh, <laughs> the supplier can memory dump using it. That uh, yeah, it's kind of cute. Well, yeah. It's, I mean, even if those um, those save routines weren't in Speedball Two. Oh. There'd have been no problem introducing them in there because obviously I've got ninety nine point nine nine percent of the data off the disk other than the copy lock track, yeah. and I could just simply copy some other um, loader stroke save routines into memory where I know they're not going to get touched, mm. and have it do the same thing. Yeah. So it just makes life so much easier yeah. that there's. Very reliable load and save routines in Speedball Two, which I can, which I could use. So yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, for me, it's like using the one in kernel. Uh, it's it's already there, so uh, why can't I use it? it? It's it works for most of the time. Yeah. Uh, you're always using. Are you always typing your little coal into the machine code monitor directly? It's never so that you fire up your ASM one or Seca or whatever assembly you're using and and writing anything there. No, no, I can I can do all reaction replay if I need to, because you know it's just a simple. It's a it's a it's a compare routine. It's a copy routine. It's um, 
patching the boot block and what have you. And you don't need to, the only time I ever have to boot up, um, and it's dev pack for, for me, I, I never really got on with as a one and seeker. Um, the only time I ever use dev pack is if I've got to give something, um, a custom header so that it can, files can go where I want them to go. Mm. Um, like in the case of Stuntman Seymour, it was two files. It was a booter file with the copy lock inside it. And once it had passed that, it would then load up this um, packed file. And I'm thinking, well, that's pretty useless. Someone's going to single file it, so it best just be me that does it then. Um, and I'll, I, it must be like a standard thing that Codemasters were using because... But the name of every boot file on the Codemasters games was VC, and it was always an imploder packed file, but with the header changed. I guess they thought that I might confuse us. I don't know. But we, we realized fairly soon it was file imploder. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I mean, for that particular game, DevPack was got, got them out for that. that was, there was no action replay involved in that. In fact, once I realized which type of protection it was, it was just a case of find out where it needed to load in memory and then basically write uh, a new header for the mm. for the file, which would safely move it around memory no matter where it loaded, so it would always end up at the right spot, mm. um, depack it and execute it. And mm. that's as complicated as it needs to get. I mean, sometimes you might have... Um, the executable to start a game off might need quite a bit of setting up, might need to copy a loader here, might need to close the system down properly, uh, might need to make sure a certain files in in memory or a, a DPAC uh, routine somewhere. And then, yeah, I, I would probably fire up DevPack and do what I need to do in that. But for a simple game like Speedball 2, which all it's doing... Is is you know I'm just latching onto existing routines and modifying code. Mm. Yeah, it can all be done in the action replay. There's there is literally no need. In fact, you're you're adding extra time mm. to use dev pack or something else to do. That's why I, when I I talk about action replay to people, when um when I say that sometimes I don't use it for its intended purpose, I use it almost as my favorite utility disc it's got all the tools on it i need oh. i don't i don't need action replay to crack speedball 2 but at the same token am i really going to rummage around in a disc box for a, um a, a utility that will calculate the boot check sum for me oh. no because action replay's got that oh. am i going to use the system to read in sectors no because I want to immediately disassemble them. Mm -hmm. And so then I'd have to then load up something else to disassemble the sectors. Mm -hmm. Action replay is your favorite utility disc, but on mm -hmm. a ROM cartridge and it's there instantly. And so, yeah, it's, it's assembler functions are never going to beat dev pack or as one or seeker, but um, for, for basic quick code, that will do the job. It's more than adequate. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. The, one of the things when I looked back at the, what we talked about was also the compare. You you wrote a compare routine and, and you had like, uh, and, and it stopped when you found an instance. Isn't there a compare in Action Replay that could do exactly the same thing? Or or why yeah, isn't there? There probably is. Um, but I'm firm. Action Replay is not infallible. Action Replay has been known to to miss things um, or not quite get certain things right. Um, okay. So like if I'm searching for uh, um, a memory address, but it's coded not using an LEA, but using a move, I think I, I, think I showed you how mm. a memory address could be found one way, yeah. but if you try to find it another way with Action Replay, that it can't find it. Um, and sometimes i just find it's just quicker for me to write a routine which is going to take me 10 seconds to write mm. it's going to 
it's going to be precisely what I want it and need it to do. There probably is a function in Action Replay. To, I think there is. It's comparing memory blocks. But the fact is, there's loads of functions in Action Replay that I just don't use because um, I found that sometimes it's failed me. Um, and I'm like, I am not doing that again. And I just think it's going to take me two seconds to write that routine. Yeah. Um, if I can't do a basic routine like that, that finds the differences between two memory blocks, there's something seriously wrong with me. Um, and I'm just like, I just rather rely on myself than allow the cartridge to do everything for me. Yeah. Um, I just, I just, I just, I like to use it for the stuff I like to use it for, but beyond that, um, I want it all in my control. Um, I don't want it to miss anything because that that one time that it misses something is something crucial. Uh, the game crashes and you look like an absolute idiot. For me, compare 1000 up until 1FFF with what's on C1000. If the cartridge failed doing that, then, then it's seriously flawed because for me, that's a byte to byte comparison and that should be relatively straightforward. Uh, well, I've had instances, and, and, I've, and I don't understand. And I don't understand why they've happened. Um, but I've had more than one instance where the action replay hasn't been accurate on a couple of areas. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and it's a case of once bitten, I'm not putting myself through that again. Yeah, I fully understand. Was there any uh, like hacked version of Action Replay fixing uh, original issues or anything? Did did somebody release their version? Black Rock of Paradox hacked Action Replay three um, and turned it into Action Replay four for AGA Amigas. Yeah. Um, and that was okay if you knew how to get it to activate properly. Excuse me. Um it there was um it, it had a few foibles. It wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't always one hundred percent reliable. The main problem it had is it only worked from a certain memory address because obviously it wasn't on a wrong cartridge anymore. Um and it would work up as high in chip memory as it possibly could. Mm. Of course as games start getting bigger and bigger, mm. they would start to overwrite that area of memory. Ah, okay, so it was released as sort of a software thing that you had separately. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something you burned onto uh, a chip and then put on the original cartridge. No, no, because unfortunately, there was never really a scene for doing that on the Amiga. Um, I think it's because Detail were quite quick at releasing updates. For the action replay, the action, the first action replay didn't last very long before they brought action replay two out. Mm. When they revised that, and then about a year and a half later, they did action replay three. So no, as far as the seams concerned, there was there was never a concerted effort to. I mean, we already knew how to get the the the, the data off the the cartridges. Mm -hmm. There were certain cheats you could put in and it would expose the memory and you could copy it. Yeah. There was no real um there was no real scene to do anything with those ROMs, but I think solely because Detail were quite quick to update it themselves. Um uh, I the mean most... stuff like the compare, if you found that that was uh, faulty and then you wrote your own little routine to to fix that or or whatever, whatever little patch and then have that burned back to an EPROM and then put back in the cartridge. Well, yeah, I suppose. I mean, I mean, that doesn't exclude the fact that I might have done something wrong. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but then it would be, uh, it would be your wrong, but in the, uh, in the action replay context. Yes, but it's the action replay has got tons and tons of functions and, oh. and, and lots of them. I just, I, I looked at them once as a curiosity, yeah. and then just never use them. Mm. Um, because the, the, it, the actual replay does a lot of wondrous things, but a lot of them are actually quite bloody useless. Yeah. Um, 
Um, and it could simply have been um, through not being able to use those particular functions properly that I misinterpreted them and I and I fucked it up myself. Well, um, but then it just goes back to not wanting to rely on the action replay to do everything for you. Um, especially as um, it's it's when you're trying to be fast, it's so easy to miss small details and then you end up looking back and you're like, how did I miss that? Because trying to go too fast didn't exercise enough control over your environment mm -hmm. on how you were working. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's just more I, possibly possibly blaming the action replay is probably probably not the right um probably not the right excuse. It's it's more me being a bit slapdash in the past mm. um and not as efficient as I could be, it's easy to blame the action replay when you bugger something up. Mm. Um, to the extent where you're like, I'm going to force myself to do it this way, that way. Mm. If anyone's got anything to say about how something wasn't done properly, mm. well, then it's solely on my head. Mm. So, um, yeah, you need to trust your tools. If you don't trust them, uh, then then you need to find alternative solutions. And and I guess you've done that. So uh, again, I, I fully sympathize with the once bitten concept. Uh, I mean. Uh, if you fail once, you're never going to trust it again. Um, uh, it's just that I wouldn't want to write those little compare routines. Uh, you did it immensely fast. I would be a lot slower. So that's why I want my tool to do it for me. <laughs> I don't know. Some of the routines that I've written an action replay in that to try to, to get it to emulate what a, a protect, protection is doing. Um, and that it's it's nothing new. I mean, normally if the routine starts to get a little bit big and complicated, I'll I'll save the damn thing out and yeah. um, save it onto disk so I can reload it. I mean, there was a game called oh, what the hell is it called? I can see it now. Oh, for God's sake! What the hell was it called? It was an army dark thing. It's it was written by Frank Newhouse. I forgot what it's called. Oh my god, it wasn't that long ago. Yes, it was. It was 2017 I did it. This is really quite embarrassing, this is. I can't remember what the game was called. Uh, let's forget that. Let's yeah, there was a game. And he did a protection check and it basically read the track into memory. Okay, uh, I, I think we sort of concluded that action replay part. Um, sorry, that was just a line of question that popped out. And uh, again, comparing how I do stuff. I, of course, use my own action replay. I've patched a, a few things uh, into being more like how I want to have them. And uh, I'm actually doing a, a process of reassembling the entire thing. But um, it's it's super complex because it's weird code. And, and I know it's not the same action replay, but uh, I'm pretty sure the Amiga one, it features a lot of weird code. And now the stupid camera died again. Just to comp I think we did, we did say most of the stuff we wanted to say around how to uh, extract stuff using um, the, the supplier as a remote extractor also for this. Uh, yeah the changes of copy lock. And we also said most of the stuff around uh, tools and, and uh, how you did things and uh, using assemblers or not. But back in the really old days, people tended to load everything up and have it stop just before execution and then crunch the entire thing into one package um, and multiple things on the disk, I guess. Um, I, I understand why that is not a thing when stuff is loading and loading and loading and, and you have, but, but if everything is sort of a one filer, wouldn't you always kind of want to go for a one filer or is the speed, uh, the speed loss for doing that, uh, an instance where you wouldn't want to do it? Well, me personally, I would, if there was the option to, to single file it, um, or have a couple of files, a title screen and the main game file compressed to the disk in Amiga DOS files rather than sector loading. Yeah. I, I probably I probably would have still have done it. I mean, they, every, every now and again, there was like um, 
You had an Archie McLean pool that could easily be single filed, hardly took up any disc capacity. Uh, and it goes back to that thing where if you don't single file something like that, um, which, as I recall, didn't even have a title screen, so you wouldn't have been removing anything from the game at all. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't single file it, what you will find will happen is somebody else will single file it, but magically the credits for who originally cracked it somehow have um, not been included. And somebody else is kind of, without saying they've cracked it, but they haven't credited who cracked it, they are mm -hmm. saying that they've done it. Um, so from my perspective, the same with Stuntman Seymour um, a couple of months ago, um, I did single file that one. And if there was a game for Fairlight or Scoop X back in the day um, that could have been single filed, then I probably would still have done it. Mm. Um, and I don't care if people think it's lame. Mm. Because what will happen is whilst obviously the, the compilation scene on the Amiga didn't last very long, mm. um, by virtue of the fact that the gains were getting bigger and bigger... Uh, and then um, it wouldn't make sense. It, uh, it needs um, to be something that sits in memory all at once with no further disk access. Well, not necessarily. I mean, it might just be it loads a couple of files and you can extract those files and put a file loader in there so it can still load them off an Amiga yeah, yeah. disk. I mean, it, it all depends on the game. It, uh, but... It, for some groups, it literally was about, there's no time for that. There's mm -hmm. time to get it cracked. Mm -hmm. There's time to get a crack intro on there. And there's time to get it on the world headquarters because I, I don't know. I don't know how people knew other groups had stuff, but every now and again, mm -hmm. the original supplier would say, all right, here we go. I've, uh, I've packaged it up for you. And uh, just so you know, uh, Paradox have got this one as well. And you'd be like, oh, well, first, no pressure there. And there is it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's head you know, to head. Yeah. It, taking the extra time to single file it, you probably suspect you'd go, no time. Mm. Got time to crack it and get it back to the original supplier and get it uploaded. Mm. Um, and just have to accept the fact that someone later down the line is going to single file it and you're probably going to you're probably not going to have your credit on there. Um, but in reality, to the most of the people that, that you would that you would care to know would know that you've done it. Mm. So the fact that it had gone to user, to user, to user, and then been single filed, mm. it's, it's largely irrelevant. But if I've had the time and the game could be either single filed or broken into as few files as possible to take up as little room on the disc as possible mm. without taking anything out of the game. Mm. And yeah, I would have been quite happy to, quite happy to do it. Cool. And yeah, yeah. But that sort of leads us to the next topic here, and that is uh, game loading from hard disk. So, um, I mean, back when I, I had an Amiga yeah. 2000, I, I, I never had an Amiga 500. So I, I started off with a hard disk, which means that I never had access to any cracking cartridges. Um, I had this little thing from Triangle, a little memory card, and then uh, what's it called? An exception 13 little button or whatever it was called. Uh, so basically like uh, an NMI trigger and then pointing that to my little new special memory that wouldn't be, it would be there, but it wouldn't be sort of seen by the system. So the system would never use it, but uh, I, I just booted my little software cartridge, basically like an expert cartridge on the C64. Uh, and, and there was a question down down the line here. <laughs> so hardware <laughs> cracking to hard disk. <laughs> that was the question. How do you do that? Um, well, obviously, um, back in the day, we wouldn't have cracked a hard disk um, for our initial release. Might have done it for a later release. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, um, I think one of the final releases that I did for Fairlight was Championship Manager 2. Um, and it was a football management game, 
everyone had been waiting years for it, and we got it. And I, if I actually figured out how to duplicate the protection on it, because it was the one game that I couldn't screw up, um, and didn't want to be blown, blamed for for cracking errors and stuff. But once it was apparent that it was an absolute bollocks to play from floppy disk, and it should never have been released like that. It should have been released where it could have been installed on hard drive. I actually did write a hard drive installer for it mm -hmm. um, because it was so, so dog slow. And that wasn't my fault. That was that was the original load routines, and that was the way they designed the, the save game feature and that. It would save a, a crap load of data out. Um, and it, 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 was, it, it was just a chore to, for people to play. I mean, I didn't care because... I, I don't care about football management games in the slightest. It was just that I knew it was it was Fairlight Amiga's final release, and it was kind of like the final big game for the Amiga. Everything up to that point for the past year had been dross. Everything that was following was going to be dross. The Amiga kind of it was checking out now for the final time, um, but this game had to be done properly. Um, but it's quite, it's actually quite easy, um, to, to, to do, uh, and the way that I did championship manager two was I, obviously I knew how the, the disc code worked. And so I knew how to extract the data off the two discs. So to create two disc images in memory, which could be copied from the hard drive, um, with an executable that I'd written and what that executable would do is it's for this particular game championship manager 2 uh it only it wasn't actually an aga game it 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 said on the box that it was for aga amigas but that was only because it required two mega chip ram there were other amigas that had two mega chip ram so um all you need to do is you would um you know, obviously the the, the 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 person who wants to install the hard drive has got to have fast men You've got to have enough fast mem to cater for the disk images and preserving of any memory that is going to be overwritten. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Championship Manager 2, it was going to use that 2 meg of chip RAM. So you would allocate 2 megs of room in fast memory, mm -hmm. and then you would copy that 2 meg of chip RAM as a backup copy to mm -hmm. fast memory, and then you would load the from load the disk images up into fast RAM. Obviously, you would have enough for that. Yeah. Um, and then you'd real time patch the the game disks, um, so that you could patch the loaders. And instead of the game wanting to load off the disk, it would just be redirected to load the data it needed from fast memory. Mm -hmm. And then before you um. Before you um, allow the game to do anything, you would preserve all system attributes, preserve the system copy list, copy all that stuff into fast memory so it's, it can't be overwritten. Um, and then just before you jump into the game, you would preserve the stack pointer, the system stack pointer, and then you would then jump into the game. The game would work. It would execute. You've already patched the routines, so it's going to be loading everything from memory, lightning fast. Mm -hmm. You're going to save everything to memory as well, because obviously you're not in an environment to be loading and saving in a system-friendly way. Mm. Um, and then obviously, if you want, you, you want the user to be able to use those saved games. So obviously you would find somewhere within the game where you could provide a method where they couldn't accidentally exit the game, mm. but you could provide something like change a text box, say quit to DOS, mm. um, and or uh, originally it might have been format disk. Mm. You don't need a format disk option anymore because the, the disks are in memory. Mm. So you change that. Mm. Um, and then what you would do is you, once once you go back to your code, mm. you kind of X out the code and jump back, um, back into fast memory to where your code is. And then you would shut down DMA and everything. You'd restore the system point stack pointer. You'd copy the memory back mm. to make a chip RAM. You'd restore the system. And as long as you hadn't missed anything out, mm. the game would, would have exited. 
and you'd be back in the exact same environment before the game had loaded up. Mm. Um, so it's, it's it's not system friendly in any way. You're just moving the system away, and then you have everything to play with, and you can be as uh, as rogue as you want in the area, and you can write, and you can read, and you can copy, and and you don't need to take care of anything. And then you just clean your clean after yourself by copying back uh, a copy of the environment as you entered the game, basically. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the great thing about Amiga is. Um... If fast memory is available on the machine, mm. it will, and you basically, uh, your executable code is set for public memory. If it finds the fast memory first, that's where your code will go. Mm. So you don't even need any super special routines to get your code into a safe area of memory, because mm. obviously, as for that particular game, that two meg of chip RAM is not safe because the game uses all of it. Mm -hmm. Now, for other hard drive versions that I did, a lot of the games only used um, the, the, the lower 512k of chip RAM. Mm. That's all they used. Mm. And so that's all you would need to preserve. Mm. So if you wanted to, you could copy routines into higher chip RAM, and you could run them from there, because the game doesn't overwrite them. But it also means there's less memory overhead, because you're not having to preserve 2 mega chip RAM, it's just 512K. Yeah. Um, and so obviously the benefit is, is without having any special routines, your code goes into fast RAM, it's protected from what's going on in the bottom half of 512K of chip RAM, mm. um, because that game cannot access that memory, because there's no reason for it to access that memory, mm. it doesn't even know it's there. Mm. Um, and you can kind of... You can play around with the game and interfere with the game and patch the game from memory that's safe mm. and it's play. Um, and you know that you can restore the system back to exactly how it was mm. before you went to the game. So it's system friendly right up to the point that you enter the game. Yeah. And then once you exit the game and restore them back, then it becomes system friendly again. Yeah. Is you can't have it system friendly whilst the game's running uh -huh. because that's how hard drives get invalidated. That's how you might have to relocate absolute code because it might be running too low in memory. Mm. And it might be overwriting Amiga DOS pointers and stuff like that. Um, so 99.99% of the games, unless they're already system friendly, if they're designed to only run from set memory addresses, mm. it's impossible to have them system friendly unless you're going to go in there and patch every single piece of code, which isn't really feasible. No, no, absolutely not. So, I mean, a game that's not system friendly written, uh, this is a way to make it work from hard disk, even if inheritedly it's not meant to run on, in a system friendly way. So, no, no, no. If, if basically, if, if a game on an Amiga boots up from a floppy disk from a boot block and it immediately kicks out the system, it is not system friendly in any way, shape, or form. It might be system friendly to initially load the first piece of code from the disk using track disk mm -hmm. device. It might be system friendly to find out um, what memory type the, the Amiga's got and know where to load. Mm -hmm. But usually once it jumps into that first piece of code, any notion of it being system friendly is complete bollocks. It's just not going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, doing that hard drive method that way, where you preserve used memory, and then take over that memory, and then restore it afterwards, it's the closest thing to system-friendly that you can get without, you know, the, the only alternative is to have the source code to the game and write it that way. Yeah. And uh, no one's given me the source code to their games tomorrow. So. And reassembly is a bit of a mess, so you don't want to do that either. So, yeah, yeah, I I get it. And, and this is also the way you are doing uh, hard disk versions for, uh, like, modern emulators today, this... Uh, what it's called? WHD load. Yeah. Yeah, WHD load. That, that, that came about because of the kind of things that crackers were doing with games. Yeah. The, the guy that actually wrote WHD load, he was interested to see how the crackers and that were making these hard drive versions. And so he wrote a system 
that would work with original games because mm. obviously it was great that us crackers are doing it for the cracked copies and what have you, but there was no there was nothing for those that had actually put their hands in their pockets and actually bought the game originally. They were it's 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 kind of harsh in a way that publishers and developers and that they kind of punishing their own their own buyers of software. I mean, I mean, there's there, there's so many mistakes with games that could have been hard drive installed, but they decided that the disc needed a copy lock. Mm. So even though the game was completely system friendly loading, mm. used a mega DOS to load the files and that, you'd have to have the floppy disk in the drive so it could do a copy lock check. I mean, that kind of defeats, you know installing something to hard drive um yeah. a few games made that mistake and that was the case also for pc where uh, normally you would have something from a cd and you would install it from cd to your hard disk but you still needed your original cd in the drive otherwise you would refuse to sort of validate that you had a legit copy i think the difference with the Amiga was it was never advertised like that it was it was it was put your disk into your internal drive and reset the Amiga. There was no, there was no kind of acknowledgement that if it wasn't for this protection scheme, mm, mm. this game could actually be installed on a hard drive and would be the better for it. Um, so I understand from the PC perspective how that came about, but on the Amiga, it was it. I, I can only think of one game that allowed you to install to a hard drive but still forced you to have a disk in the drive um i think for all the rest of the developers and that they just they didn't but oddly though i say that you'd get the american version of that same game and it wouldn't carry the disk protection like copy lock it would have a please enter uh, from the manual, from page, blah, 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 line. I'm like, I mean, it was specifically mentioned that they, so they can install it on a hard drive. And it's like, why why have you punished the European yeah. owners who could have had the same thing? I mean, I mean, obviously, hard drives were expensive. But as I understand it, floppy drives for Commodore 64s were expensive for a long time. and But the best way to encourage people to want to adopt new technology is to give them enough reasons to want to yeah I mean, that's how amiga owners got their one meg expansions because games started using one meg yeah. um and i think hard drive adoption could have been i don't think it'd have been hugely different but it might have there might have been more that had hard drives if developers didn't go out of their way to bloody exclude them yeah I, I guess uh, C64 tapes is like Amiga discs and C64 discs is like Amiga hard disks uh, and C64 hard disk. I don't know what that is. That would be, there is no equivalent <laughs> in the Amiga, but. <laughs> well, I know what cartridges, weren't they, weren't they, weren't they going to be the next, um, they, they was going to stop the fair lights of the world? Cast yeah, yeah, the CD32 and uh, uh, all of that, <laughs> CDTV. Yeah, yeah, that, that, this the, the the Commodore sixty four console that was um yeah yeah uh, C sixty four GS gaming system uh, it was without the keyboard and it had basically the cartridge slot on the top but uh, the rest was the same. Did uh, did any anyone crack any of the cartridges on the Commodore? Well, I mean it's the same C sixty four cartridge, so cracking a cartridge is the same whether you crack it like that or crack it like any other way. The the cool thing with cartridge, of course, is you have the very fast uh, bank swapping, uh, so you can swap in things and you can sort of, um, and you can't emulate that using a disc. It's dreadfully slow. So um, and there is a game called Toki. Uh, a monkey game um and eventually there was a, a version out that actually worked including the music i think they had to skip a bit of the animation and and all of that to have it in memory but uh yeah mm, I, i'd say that's still better from cartridge yeah and yeah, we had tokyo on the amiga it was a, that was a bloody good game that one but didn't, didn't the commodore 64 console have a packing game 
we were to press a key on the keyboard to get it to start, but it didn't have a keyboard. Ah, <laughs> yeah, well, that wouldn't work. The thing is that uh, because the second mouse, uh, it's, uh, the way it works, if you press uh, one of the direction, it actually gives you a space. So uh, you could fid fiddle with uh, one of the joysticks and sort of emulate a few of the keys at least. But uh, yeah, that would be the only way around. All right, Phil, thank you so much. Uh, we should, what do you say? Skip, well, quit while we're still ahead. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for this uh, additional piece that we add to the end of this episode, which makes it complete. Uh, I'm sure a number of people would be seriously annoyed by the fact that we had sort of a cliffhanger because uh, the first episode is ending when uh, the game boots and bugs. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we had a version, it didn't work. And yeah. then this second episode, because uh, as it is, uh, people are watching the first episode and then only half of the views are, are on the second one. So if I have a thousand views on, on episode one, there is always like uh, 500 also for only for the second episode. But I think this could be an exception. Yeah. Hope well, for that. We'll Phil, see. thanks for being a super competent and super friendly and super uh, accessible guy uh, willing to share your knowledge. It's really, really appreciated. And, and there are fewer on the Amiga than there are on the C64 doing that. So you're doing a great job and keep up the good work. I will speak again, no doubt. Thank you. So that was everything we had for today. It was an epic conclusion. I really love this. So should I learn to crack on the Amiga? Yeah, mm, it looks, looks really interesting. It's uh, the, the part that scares me the most is when Phil is sort of typing furiously fast, uh, small little snippets of code on the on 68,000 which I know very little of. So uh, yeah, that will be an uphill battle to learn that and also do it as quick as he does. So uh, yeah, probably not, probably leaving all that work to fill. But uh, now you have seen it done in action, cracking on the Amiga. Hope you enjoyed it. All the best. Bye bye.